This is the 10th video in a series devoted to abstract linear algebra. And today we're gonna to look at the notion of linear independence and linear dependence with lots of examples and some basic results. So let's jump into some definitions. So we wanna start with a vector space V over an arbitrary field K and then a set of vectors from V. So I think it's pretty clear from context that these come from B, V, but let's just note that that is a subset of V. So here we've got a collection of N vectors that are in V. Next, we say that this set, or sometimes just this collection of N vectors, is linearly independent if the equation alpha 1 V1 plus all the way up to alpha N Vn equals zero only admits the trivial solution. In other words, this equation implies that alpha 1 equals alpha 2 equals all the way up to alpha n equals 0. So in other words, the only way to take a linear combination of these vectors v, i and get 0 is with the trivial linear combination. In other words, all the weights are 0. Next, we say that S is linearly dependent essentially if it's not linearly independent. But we could write that as follows. If the equation alpha v1 plus all the way up to alpha n vn equals zero has a solution where those alpha i come from the field and they are not all zero. Okay, so now that we're armed with these definitions, let's start by looking at a bunch of examples. And the first ones we'll look at will be to determine if some sets are linearly independent or linearly dependent. Starting with this set of two vectors from R2. So let's recall that R2 is the set of all ordered pairs of real numbers, but for reasons that we'll see later, it's advantageous to write them as these columns. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, let's take a linear combination of elements in this set, set it equal to zero, and show that the coefficients must be zero. Or they must be zero to show it's linearly independent. If we get another solution, then these are linearly dependent. Okay, so just to reiterate, we want to solve the following equation. X times 1, 2 plus y times 3 minus 4 equals the 0 vector. Okay, but now using our standard rules for scalar multiplication and vector addition, that'll turn into the following equation. We'll have x plus 3y and then 2x minus 4y is what this left-hand side combines to equals the, z the vector 0, 0. But this vector equation with two components is the same thing as having two scalar equations. In other words, we know that x plus 3y equals 0 and 2x minus 4y is also equal to 0. And now you can solve this using really any strategy that you want at this point that you might have learned in like a high school algebra class. Maybe the thing that I'll do is multiply this entire first equation by minus 2 and then add the two equations. So let's see what that gives us. We'll have minus 2 times x plus 2 times x. That'll give us 0. And then we'll have minus 2 times 3y. That's negative 6y minus 4y is negative 10y equals 0. Okay, so just to reiterate where that came from, multiplying this equation by negative 2 turned it into negative 2x minus 6y equals 0. And then adding those two equations gave us this. But now if negative 10y equals 0, that tells us that y must indeed be equal to 0 itself. Okay, but then if y is equal to 0, we can plug that into any of these equations up here. Maybe plugging it into this first equation, we'll see that x is also equal to 0. But that means that the only linear combination of these two vectors that achieves the 0 vector is the trivial linear combination. Our coefficients had to be 0. So that means, yes, these vectors are linearly independent. 
So let's maybe clean up this board and we're gonna look at these same two vectors, but instead of working over R2, which is a field over R, we'll work over a finite field. So now we're looking at the same vectors, but now we're over the finite field of five elements. Recall that's the field of the integers modulo five, which we played around with in previous videos. Okay, well, notice that since we're in the integers modulo five, we can change this a little bit. So maybe instead of writing a negative four here, we can write a one because in F5, negative four is the same thing as one as we saw before. And now we're ready to play the same game that we did before. So we'll take an arbitrary linear combination of these two, set it equal to the zero vector and then solve for the coefficients. So here we'll have X um, one, two, plus y31 equals our zero vector. But notice that gives us a slightly different equation of x plus 3y and then 2x plus y equals the zero vector like that. Okay, nice. But now let's notice that that gives us x plus 3y equals zero and 2x plus y equals zero. And now instead of solving this by combining these two equations, I'm gonna instead solve it with the substitution method just for a little bit of variety. So notice that if x plus three y equals zero, that means x equals negative three y, but negative three in F5 is two. So we have x equals two y. But now we can take this value for x and plug it into our second equation. And that'll give us like four y plus y equals zero. In other words, five y equals zero. But there's a little bit of a problem here because in F5, five is equal to zero. And we end up with zero equals zero. And this is true for any y. So you can multiply any of these values of y by five. That's just like multiplying it by zero in F5. So if you recall what this means from a previous class as to the number of solutions, it means that there are infinitely many solutions. And all of those solutions lie on this line right here. We have x equals two y. So maybe we could just set y equal to one. Notice that implies x equals two. And that gives us an example of a linear dependence relation. Okay. So let's put these values up here and see that we have two times one, two plus three, one equals the zero vector. In other words, we have a solution to this equation where they are not all zero, the weights are not all zero. So that means in F5, these vectors are linearly dependent instead of being linear, linearly independent. Okay, so let's clean up the board and then we'll look at another example. So next we're gonna look at a set of vectors in R3. So we've got three vectors, one, two, one, zero, one, two, and one, one, zero. And we wanna determine if these are linearly independent or linearly dependent. So we'll start by setting up a would-be linear dependence relation and see if that implies all of the coefficients are zero or if it's possible for them not to be all zero. And that'll tell us if we've got independence or dependence. Maybe here we'll take the coefficients to be x, y, and z because we only have three vectors and that's a nice choice. So that's going to give us x times vector 1, 2, 1 plus y, 0, 1, 2 plus z, 1, 1, 0 equals the zero vector. Nice. But now we can do our scalar multiplication and vector addition on this left hand side, giving us x plus z in the first component, 2x plus y plus z in the second component, and then x plus 2y in the third component. So that'll be equal to our zero vector. And then from there, we know that if a vector is equal to another vector, all the components are equal. So we can take this vector equation and turn it into three scalar equations. We know that x plus z equals zero, 2x plus y plus z equals zero, and finally x plus 2y equals zero, like that. Okay, now there's probably a lot of ways to solve this. And in fact, 
After we do a little bit more of the structure of vector spaces, we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at how to solve systems of equations using the machinery of linear algebra. But at this point, maybe we'll just use straightforward substitution. So let's take this first equation and this last equation and solve for z and y in terms of x. Notice that allows us to write z as negative x, and it allows us to write y as negative one-half x. So that's pretty nice because now we can take this value of z and this value of y and plug it into the second equation, and then we've got an equation that only involves x. So let's see what that gives us. We'll have 2x plus y, but notice y is minus half x, plus z, but notice z is minus x equals zero. But notice we've got 2x minus x, that's going to be 1x, minus a half x, that's going to give us a half x. So we've got a half x equals zero, which tells us that x equals zero. Then if we roll this into our equations, which we have up there, we see that that means that y equals zero and z equals zero. So the only way to have a linear combination of these three vectors and get the zero vector is for all of the coefficients to be zero. So that means that these three vectors are indeed linearly independent. Good. So let's maybe do a couple more examples and then we'll prove some basic results. So for our next example, I've got another set of three vectors, again in R3. We're gonna check if these are linearly independent using the same strategy. So we'll start with a linear combination. So an arbitrary linear combination. I'll take my coefficients to be X, Y, and Z again. And then I have that linear combination is equal to the zero vector in R3, which is zero, zero, zero. Now maybe I'll skip one of the steps that we've been doing and just roll this right into a system of three equations. Notice my first equation will be x plus 2z equals zero. That comes from the first entry of both sides of this equation if you were to collapse this left-hand side into a single vector. Then we have x plus y plus 3z equals zero for the second one and then y plus z equals zero for the third one. Now we'll do a similar thing to what we did on the last board, and we can use this first equation and this last equation to solve for x and y in terms of z this time. So notice we've got x is equal to negative 2z, and we have y is equal to negative z. Okay, and again, we can take this value of x and this value of y and plug it into our second equation and see what that gives us. So x is 2z, so that gives us negative 2z. y is negative z, so that's minus z. And then built into this equation is 3z, so that's going to be plus 3z equals 0. But let's notice that reduces to zero equals zero, which is true for all z. So let's write that down, true for all z. So that means that we in do indeed have in a solution, and that solution kind of has z as a free variable. So let's see, what happens if we set z equal to one? So if z is one, that means that x is negative two and y is is equal to negative one. And then furthermore, let's notice that this equation up here turns into negative two times the vector one, one, zero, and then minus the vector zero, one, one, and then plus the vector two, three, one equals the zero vector. So in fact, we have achieved a linear dependence relation of this form. In other words, a way of combining these three vectors to get the zero vector where not all coefficients are zero. So just to reiterate, this makes this set of vectors linearly dependent, not linearly independent. Okay, so let's do maybe one more example before we move on. So for our next example, we've got a set of two polynomials in R adjoin X. Let's recall that R adjoin X is a vector space over R. It's the vector space of all polynomials. So that means our vectors are polynomials. 
So we probably shouldn't use x as one of our coefficients here because x is the variable for our polynomials. So maybe we'll use like alpha one and alpha two kind of in line with our general statement over here. But the same kind of strategy will apply as before. What we'll do is take a linear combination, set it equal to zero, and show that the coefficients must be zero. So let's look, alpha one, two plus x squared, plus alpha two times five plus three x equals the zero vector, but the zero vector is the zero polynomial here. Okay, well now let's kind of put everything together. That's gonna give us something like this. Uh, 2 alpha 1 plus 5 alpha 2, so that's our constant terms, and then we'll have plus, let's see, it will be 3 alpha 2x, and then plus alpha 1x squared equals 0, so something like that. Now we want to show that this being equal to 0 implies that alpha 1 and alpha 2 are both 0. Now, how might we do that? Well, let's give this a name just so that we can have a little bit of help. Let's maybe give this name P adjoin or P of X. And now we can evaluate this at certain numbers and that will give us a system of equations for alpha one and alpha two. So recall that what we want is for P of X to be equal to zero for all X. So that's what it means for a polynomial to be equal to zero. It means that it's equal to zero for anything that you, you were to plug into it. So that tells us that P evaluated, of, P evaluated at zero is zero, but P evaluated at zero is also two alpha one plus five alpha two. Great, and that's because these two guys zero out. Furthermore, P evaluated at one will also be zero. So here we'll have two alpha one, plus another alpha one, that'll be three alpha one. And then we'll have five alpha two plus three alpha two, that'll be eight alpha two equals zero. Now we've got a nice system of equations that looks like our first example. So how might we solve this? Well, maybe let's take this first equation, multiply it by three, and the second equation and multiply it by negative two. That'll give us a setup so that we can combine these two equations to cancel out the alpha one term. Notice that gives us something like six alpha one plus 15 alpha two equals zero. And then negative six alpha one minus 16 alpha two equals zero. Now we'll add these two equations and that'll end up giving us minus alpha two equals zero. We have six minus six for alpha one and 15 minus 16 for alpha two. But if negative alpha two is equal to zero, that means alpha two is equal to zero. But then plugging in alpha two equals zero into any of these two equations will tell us that alpha one is also equal to zero. So in the end, that's exactly what we needed for this set to also be linearly independent. Good, okay. So now that we've like done quite a few examples, let's get rid of this board and then we will look at some standard results. So now we've got a standard classification result involving linear independence and linear dependence. And it says that the collection of vectors V1 to Vn is linearly dependent if and only if one of the Vi can be written as a linear combination of the others. Okay, so let's notice this is an if and only if statement, which means we have two things to prove, a forward direction and a reverse direction. Let's start with the forward direction. So in other words, we will suppose that the collection V1 up to Vn is linearly dependent. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that there exists alpha one to alpha n not from our field, not all zero. Maybe that means that alpha i is not equal to zero for some i between one and n. 
such that, and then alpha one, V one, plus all the way up to, I'll put a middle term in here, alpha I, V I, plus all the way up to alpha N, V N equals zero. Now I think you can see where we're going. We've isolated this alpha I, V I term out. We probably wanna solve for it. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. Notice now we can write alpha I, V I as minus, alpha one V one plus all the way up to alpha I minus one V I minus one plus alpha I plus one V I plus one all the way up to alpha N V N. So that's exactly the same sum. It's just, it does not include the alpha I V I and obviously the sign is changed because we moved all of that stuff over to the right hand side of the equation. Okay. But now since alpha i is not equal to zero, that means it has a multiplicative inverse, namely one over alpha i or alpha i inverse, but we'll write it as one over alpha i. So writing that out, we have vi is equal to minus alpha one over alpha i times v1 plus up to minus alpha i minus one over alpha i v i minus one and then plus minus alpha i plus one over alpha i v i plus one and then finally at the end we have minus alpha n over alpha i v n. In other words, we have this VI is definitely a linear combination of the other vectors, which is exactly what we needed to show this forward direction. Okay, so now let's get rid of this and we'll do the reverse direction. Okay, we just got done with the forward direction. Now we're gonna do the reverse direction. So in other words, we'll suppose that one of the VI can be written as a linear combination of the others. So in other words, um, we have, I'll call them beta i now. So beta one up to beta i minus one and then beta i plus one up to beta n. So notice I've removed the ith term because that's the one that we're writing in terms of the others um, such that v i is equal to beta one v one plus all the way up to beta i minus one v i minus one plus beta i plus one v i plus one plus all the way up to beta n v n. But you can probably see where we're going now. We can move this v i to the other side of the equation and that'll leave us with this. We have beta one v one plus all the way up to beta i minus one v i minus one and then plus negative one times v i plus beta i plus one v i plus one all the way up to beta n v n equals zero. But let's see what we've got. We've got a linear combination of our vectors v one through v n equals zero and not all of the coefficients are zero. Notice that the coefficient of V1 is not equal to zero. Perhaps the coefficient of all of the betas is equal to zero, but the coefficient of V1 is not equal to zero. But the fact that one of these coefficients is not zero tells us that our set is linearly dependent. Okay, but since it's linearly dependent, that's exactly what we wanted to end up with. Great, and that finishes this proof. Okay, so now that we've got this, we're gonna look at the notion of a basis. So a collection of vectors B, which is a subset of V, is called a basis for V if it satisfies two properties. So first, the set B is linearly independent. So we just talked about linear independence. And second, the span of the ve vectors in B is equal to V. We discussed what the span was in a previous video. So let's look at the following classification theorem for a basis. So it says that B is a basis of V if and only if every vector V in V can be written uniquely. So that's a really important thing here. It says uniquely as a linear combination of elements in B. Okay, so let's prove this. Again, it's an if and only if statement, so there are two things to prove. So let's go with this forward direction first. 
and we're assuming that B is a basis of V. Now let's take V in V and try to express it as a linear combination two different ways. So, and we'll write B, V equals alpha one V one plus all the way up to alpha N V N and as beta one V one plus all the way up to beta N V N where these alpha I and these beta I are in our field K and the V I come from our basis set B. Great. Now you might say, well, what if our first linear combination uses totally different vectors than our second linear combination? Well, that's okay because we can just add the vectors from our second linear combination with weights of zero so that these contain exactly the same vector. So it's not really a problem. And also let's notice we're using V1 up to VN. That may or may not be all of the elements from B. B could in fact have infinitely many elements. But when we're talking about the span, the span is taking linear combinations which are finite sums. So that's also a really important thing. Okay, so now we can rearrange this pretty easily. We can subtract this to the other side of the equation and very quickly that'll give us alpha 1 minus beta 1 times v1 plus all the way up to alpha n minus beta n times vn equals 0. Again that's by this equation right here. But now we know our set B is linearly independent and linear independence implies that this type of equation right here has only a solution where the coefficients of the VIs are zero. So that means we have alpha I minus beta I is equal to zero for all I between one and N, but that's the same thing as saying alpha I is equal to beta I um, for all i between 1 and n, but that means that our expression of v as a linear combination was unique. So to reiterate, we tried to express it two different ways, but we ended up showing that expressing it two different ways ended showing that those were the same way to express this as a linear combination. That's how we got uniqueness. Okay, let's get rid of this and we'll do the reverse direction. Okay, so now let's prove the reverse direction. So we're assuming that every vector V and V can be written uniquely as a linear combination of elements from B, and we wanna show that that implies that B is a basis. Let's recall in order for B to be a basis, it must span V and it must be a linearly independent set. Let's start by proving spanning. So we'll take a V in V, and then let's look at our statement. Our statement that says that every V in V can be written as a linear combination of elements from B. But that tells us that V equals alpha one V one plus all the way up to alpha N V N for alpha I in K and V I in B. But that's exactly saying that V is in the span of B. Let's recall that the span of B is just the set of all linear combinations of elements in B, and that's exactly what we have here. Okay, so now let's do linear independence. So let's suppose that beta one V one plus all the way up to beta N V N equals zero. And then also notice that this is the same thing as zero times V one plus all the way up to zero times V N. So what have we done here? We've taken the zero vector and we've expressed it two ways. One as this linear combination with the betas and one as this trivial linear combination with just zeros. But now the uniqueness tells us that all the coefficients here are equal to all of the coefficients there. But that's exactly saying that beta i equals zero for all i between one and n. But that's exactly what we needed for linear independence. Okay, so now that we've done this result, I wanna introduce one more definition that goes along with the definition of a basis and then we'll look at some examples. Okay, before we look at our new definition, let's look at some standard bases. 
And we'll look first at RNCN and then the vector space of polynomials and then the vector space of polynomials with a certain degree or less. So we wanna first start by defining these vectors E1, E2, EI and EN. So in other words, EI for an arbitrary I between one and N. And very simply, those are defined so that all the components are zero except in the ith position where we get a one. So in other words, E1 is one with a bunch of zeros below it. E2 starts with zero, then has a one, and then a bunch of zeros below it, and so on and so forth, until we get to En where we have a lot of zeros and then a one. So notice that those are vectors inside of Rn or Cn, just depending on if you're working over a real vector space or a complex vector space. And the collection of these vectors is called the standard basis of Rn or Cn, or really Kn, where K could be an arbitrary field. So often we work in the standard basis. Next, the standard basis for a polynomial vector space would be just these monomials. So we've got one x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, so on and so forth. Then let's say we look at all polynomials with degree less than or equal to two, or more generally degree less than or equal to n. Then we would have just a few vectors. So maybe in the less than or equal to two case, we would have one x and x squared. So notice we've got three vectors here. That's the standard basis for k2 adjoined x, or sometimes this is called this p2. Now we'll look at a following definition, which gives us some sort of idea for the relation between a basis and these sort of standard vector spaces Kn. So let's suppose that V is a vector space and it has a basis made of n vectors. So those vectors are V1 up to Vn. From there, we wanna define a coordinate map, which is kind of a canonical or very natural linear transformation. We'll call it gamma sub B, where this is the basis. I should point that out, this is the basis. And it goes from V to Kn. So in other words, elements of our vector space, which may look like a lot of different things, to these columns with n entries. And what it does is gamma b evaluated a vector v is this column alpha 1 to alpha n if v is equal to alpha 1 v1 plus all the way up to alpha n v n. So what it's doing is writing V as a linear combination of the basis, which we know is possible by the definition of a basis, and then retrieving the weights from those basis vectors and putting them in a column or an n-tuple if you prefer. Okay, so now let's revisit this example. So we've got one x, x squared being the standard basis of k2x or p2. So let's maybe call this B for the time being. And notice that that defines a natural map, gamma B from P2, I think that's maybe more standard, up to K3. And what does it do? Well, it takes the polynomial, maybe written as alpha zero plus alpha one X plus alpha two X squared, which is a arbitrary way of writing an element of P2. It's a quadratic polynomial. And it writes it as this column alpha one, alpha zero, alpha one and alpha two. Okay, so here we're getting some sort of relation between the space of polynomials where the degree is bound above by something and this sort of space of three tuples in this case, or triples. Okay, nice. So let's get rid of this and we'll maybe do one more example and then some warm up exercises. So for our example, we'll decide if this set B, which is two, three, one minus one as vectors in R2 is indeed a basis of R2. So let's recall that means we need to check two things, linear independence and spanning. So let's start with linear independence as that makes it pretty similar to something that we did at the beginning of the video. So we wanna take arbitrary linear combinations of these, set it equal to zero and show that the coefficients have to be zero. So that means we've got x times two, three plus y times one minus one is equal to the zero vector but that gives us a system of two equations and two unknowns. 
2x plus y equals 0. And then 3x minus y equals 0. So that's just from kind of standard stuff that we did earlier, just one component at a time. But now let's notice that this is set up quite nicely. We can add these two equations, and we'll see that tells us that 5x equals 0, which means that x equals 0. Okay, nice. But now if x equals 0, we can run that back up here and see that that tells us immediately that y equals 0. So in other words, yes, this set is linearly independent. And now we need to show that it, it also spans R2. How we'll do that is take an arbitrary element from R2 and write it as a linear combination of these guys. So let's take, like I said, an arbitrary element, V, which maybe we could write as A, B in R2. And what we'll try to do is find x and y such that x times 2, 3 plus y times 1 minus 1 equals a, b. But now we'll play the same game as the, we did over there. We'll just solve for x and y again. But that turns into a system of two equations just like it did before. 2x plus y equals a this time. And then we'll have 3x minus y equals b this time. Now we can add those two equations and we immediately see that 5x equals a plus b, which means x equals a plus b over 5. And then, well, what would y be? Well, we can figure out y by plugging this value of x maybe into this equation. Let's see, plugging it up there, we'll see that we have 2 over 5, a plus b plus y equals a. But now we can move all of that over to the other side of the equation, and we'll see that y is equal to 3 fifths a minus 2 fifths b. So we do have a linear combination of our basis vectors equal to an arbitrary vector in R2. It's just those weights depend on the arbitrary vector some way. And those weights are this a plus b over five and then this three over five a minus two over five b. But we do have spanning, which was our goal. Okay, so we've got linear independence and we have spanning. So that means yes, this is a basis of R2. So now that we've got that, let's maybe look at this coordinate map that we defined before. We just showed that this was a basis of R2. Now we're ready to look at the coordinate map of this basis. And we'll look at what the coordinate map does to the vector 4, 5, which is in R2. So let's look over here. The coordinate map should take a vector and write it as a column where the entries are the weights of the linear combinations of the basis vectors. So in other words, we should have gamma b of 4, 5 equal to x, y, where x times 2, 3 plus y times 1 minus 1 equals 4, 5. So that's exactly decoding this definition over here into our example. We just need to find x and y, which we can do by solving this vector equation, which can quickly be turned into a system of equations. So this is 2x plus y equals 4, and then 3x minus y equals 5. We'll play the same game that we've been playing. We add these two equations, and we'll see that 5x equals 9, which means x equals 9 over 5. But then throwing that back here, we'll see that 18 over 5 plus y equals 4. But notice 4 is the same thing as 20 over 5, which tells us that y is equal to 2 over 5. So the fact that x is 9 over 5 and y is 2 over 5 tells us that gamma b evaluated at 4, 5 is the vector 9 over 5, 2 over 5. Great.
Okay, so I think that's good enough on this new information. Now I'm gonna leave you guys with a couple of warm up exercises to practice this. So here I've got three nice warm up problems. So the first is built off of our last example. So we have the same set of vectors, and now we want to determine if this set of vectors is a basis of F3, 2, or F5, 2. I guess I should say and or F5, 2. Then, in the case that it is a basis, determine the coordinate map evaluated at 4, 5. Okay, so let's recall that this is a finite field with three elements, so we're working over the integers modulo three, whereas that's a finite field with five elements. For the next one, let's determine if the following two sets are linearly independent. So this first set is a set of vectors from R3. We have one, three, minus one, two, five, one, and one, zero, one. The second is a set of quadratic polynomials. So maybe we'll say that this comes from R adjoin X. So in other words, we're in the polynomials with real coefficients. Then finally, show that this set, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1, forms a basis of R3, and then find the coordinate map of this basis evaluated at 2, minus 1, 3. And that's a good place to stop.